You guys can have a seat, sorry. I to tell you that. <laughs> She's going to talk for a little bit. <laughs> oh, Good Friday. You know, we were, you know, obviously there's some technical difficulties, and Ryan just got up in your praise. He's like, I know you guys have some heavy stuff going on. And I was all in a bad mood because of the technical difficulties, and it was just, so refreshing, I don't know, to hear that. Like, oh my gosh, there is so much more going on that is so much heavier than technical difficulties and more important, and it's Good Friday. So I just had to say that up front. So I am so glad you guys are all here. I was just sitting there and worshiping, and these two always just bring me right into the presence of the Spirit, and I just love that. Um, but I was just sitting there and feeling um, how much I love you guys. It was so weird, but I, and I love this church, and I love the intimacy that we have here just because we're here to honor God, coming here on a Friday night to acknowledge Good Friday. You know, it came a little early this year. It is March still. Usually it's April. So it kind of sneaks up on you. But actually, the staff has been thinking about it for some time. And a few, several weeks ago, we were in a leadership meeting, and we were talking about, um, you know, the coming Easter week. And I was kind of struck by a conversation that arose about the Good Friday message. And someone posed the question, is it necessary to focus on the brutality of Christ's death? I mean, ultimately, if we think about it, Easter is really about the conquering of death through the resurrection, right? And we as Christians, we do focus a lot on the cross. When you think about it, it's really just an execution tool that was used by the Romans and some other, some other cultures at that time. And it kind of gave me some pause, and I had to think about that. To think, is focusing on the crucifixion really just a way to sensationalize Christ's death? A way to maybe use fear tactics or guilt trips to draw people to the church? Well, never really thought about that. But for some reason, this story entered my mind, and I shared it with the group, and they actually encouraged me to share it with you today. So that's what I'm going to do right now. So when I was about 12 years old, it was the summer before I was going into seventh grade, I went to Germany with my cousin to visit our family out there in Berlin. And let me tell you, my uncle, he's so funny. He is the biggest history buff that you will ever meet. I mean, he had to show us every remotely significant piece of art or architecture or museum, anything of historical importance. And mind you, I was only in middle school at the time, so I was thinking, I really want to take it all in, but most of it, it really went over my head. But there was one thing, one thing that I will never forget was when he took us to see a Nazi concentration camp. And at that age, I sort of knew what the Holocaust was. But I walked away a different person that day. As we entered, we stood in this empty, sort of eerie, just prison yard. And my uncle explained to us that this is where the Jews and the inmates would line up every morning, whether rain, or snow for hours, waiting for everybody to be accounted for who was still alive. And then we meandered through what was their depressing living quarters, and on the walls were life-size images of the people. And there was one image that just still burns in my mind. It was an image of all of these feeble and devastated bodies just crammed into one bunk, maybe four, into one bunk. And their eyes 
they just seem to be looking right at me, almost as if they were pleading to me, crying out to me to help them. And I just freely meandered through what was their former hell. And as I walked around the different displays, every step I just felt heavier and heavier. And then we went to view the showers. And my uncle subtly explained to my cousin and I that it wasn't water that came out of those shower heads. I just couldn't speak. It wasn't on the train ride until we went home and we're headed home and I began to express my thoughts and I said to my uncle, you know what, I never want to think about that again. And he looked at me directly and he said, Robin, you have to think about that again. Every day, you have to remember that. And I got angry. I started to debate him. I was so appalled that he wouldn't let me look the other way. It took me years to begin to understand where he was coming from. So, is it necessary to focus on the crucifixion of Christ? instead of just the resurrection? What would the defeat of the Nazis in the 1940s mean to us if we never took notice of the evil that was being defeated? Or what would going to war mean to us if we ever never stopped to remember why? What does the resurrection mean to us? If we never consider what was overcome and what we've been rescued from, death. So Good Friday is crucial to our faith as believers in Christ. Good Friday is a literal image of what we've been rescued from and what kind of God we serve. So tonight we're going to commemorate that faithful yet good day by remembering. Remembering he who died for us. So I ask tonight, please just quiet your minds and allow your hearts to reflect. We're going to read some scripture passages. And we're also going to identify different attributes of God that are revealed to us through the crucifixion. This is so that we can remember that God is good and he deserves our honor. So our first attribute tonight that we're going to bring out is the God of humility. So please hear the word of the Lord. Philippians 2, 6 through 11. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus reveals God as a God of humility. What other gods have you heard of that revealed their glory by becoming like the lowest of their subjects? By giving up their divine privilege to become a slave and die in one of the most demeaning ways in existence? I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like any of the other gods from other cultures that I've ever heard about. So I, I looked some up. I want to share them with you. Let's start with 
the famous Greek gods. Everybody's probably heard of, about at least one. Take Ares. He was known as the god of war and defense. Something I learned about him, though, in my research is that he showed his glory by upholstering his throne with human skin. Yeah. Okay, we'll take Poseidon. You may have heard of him. Known as the god of the sea. But the people believed him to be bad-tempered, greedy, and very, very vengeful. Or Zeus. Most of us have heard of Zeus. He was known as the supreme god, the lord of justice. It was believed that when he was in high spirits, he would bless the world with fine weather. But in case of a bad mood, he would throw wind and lightning and thunder and rain to cause disaster on the mortals. So don't get on his bad side. Okay, we'll take the Egyptian pharaohs. They were seen as reincarnations of gods. They were the military, political, and religious heads of state, and they built pyramids and monuments in their own honor. The Chinese god, Tishe Shen, known as the god of wealth, he was believed to be the head of a vast bureaucracy of gods, and he would show his supremacy by always dressing in fine robes and sumptuous clothing. A Hindu god, Lakshmi, she was known as the goddess of wealth and beauty. She was essentially a domestic deity because every household worshipped her, because who wouldn't want a piece of her wealth and her beauty, right? But our god, the God reveals his glory in a much different way. He became like his subjects. And Christ went through tremendous rejection by his subjects, by his own people, many of whom probably sat at his feet listening to his teaching. His best friends rejected him, one who promised never to do so, even if it meant dying with him. Or take the religious leaders, those who supposedly believed in the same scripture as him. But they spit on him, and they beat him, and they mocked him when he was down. They would do anything to shame this meek and humble man for his growing influence in their world. They went beyond just killing him to get him out of their way. They crucified. A death meant for the worst of criminals. To publicly die in utter shame and humiliation. And what did our precious Lord do through all of that? He was silent through the mockery. He was compliant through the beating. And he prayed for his persecutors through his unjust and torturous death. Wow. And I get to claim him as my God. Not a God who has, has to display his power through upholstering his throne with human skin. Or a God whose justice depends on his mood that day. Or even a God who needs to build monuments on the backs of slaves in order to display his honor. How about just the monument of the meekest and purest character that we could imagine? So tonight, let us remember that we serve a God of humility. Our next attribute tonight is God of sacrifice. Please hear the word of the Lord. Isaiah 53, 1-11 He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. 
He was despised, and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our own rebellion, crushed for our own sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep in silence before the shears, did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. You see, we are the ones who have rebelled, yet he served the sentence. We are the ones who have sinned, yet he was led to the slaughter. We are the ones who have strayed away, yet he faced the separation. What other God do you know that would make himself the sacrificial lamb? Let us remember that we serve a God of sacrifice. Our next point tonight is God of relationship. Before this faithful Good Friday, no one could commune with God because of sin. What I say to the kids all the time in its simplest form is, God and sin don't mix. God is holy. Sin is unholy. They do not mix. God is life. Sin is death. They do not mix. Therefore, God resided in a small room behind a thick curtain. In his house, the temple. His presence was shielded from his people. For the holiness, his holiness, destroys all that is unholy. No one entered the Holy of Holies except for the high priest, and that was only once a year. And even then, he risked losing his life for any sin that was unatoned for through ceremonial sacrifices and cleansing. But thankfully, we serve a God of relationship. And when Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished, and he gave up his spirit, God made a bold statement through an impressive miracle. A miracle that revealed to his people that his relationship with him, the Holy One, had been restored. So we're going to watch a video. And as we watch, remember that God is a God of relationship who wants to be in your presence and you in his.
veil was torn, the Holy of Holies was exposed, and God's redemptive plan is complete. God's presence is now accessible to all, and the age of animal offerings is over, because the ultimate offering has been sacrificed so that you and I can be with him. So let us remember that our God is a God of relationship. Our last point tonight encompasses it all. And I'm sure by now that you have gathered that God is a God of great love. Love beyond our imaginations. Love that gives eternal life. Love that gives fullness of life. And love that never fails. His love is available to you thanks to Christ. Let us remember that God is a God of love. Please hear the word of the Lord. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is a spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and He loved us all so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as, ex as examples of His incredible wealth, of His grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believe, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. We're going to close tonight with a time of reflection. This is just a time for you to be with God and remember him as he has revealed himself. <laughs> through the crucifixion. As you remember that our God is a God of humility, I want you to head to the stations over here. And there's a couple buckets of sand. This is a place for you to search your heart, humble yourself, and bury any gods that you are putting before the Holy One. And of course, you may not be bowing down to the specific Greek god of revenge or the specific Hindu goddess of beauty. But is there something that's standing in the way of you and him? Something that takes precedence in your life that he'd like you to surrender? You'll see no cards that are on the table over there. And there's pens for you to write down whatever that is that is holding you back from him. And you're going to put it in the bucket on your left. Take a nice big scoop of sand from the bucket on your right. And humbly bury any other gods that are before him. In honor of Christ being buried for you. As you remember that our God is a God of sacrifice. Head to the communion stations. As you eat the bread, 
remember that it symbolizes Christ's body, which was given for you. And just as you take in the bread, take him in. As you drink the juice, remember that it symbolizes Christ's blood, which was poured out for you. Poured out for you as the ultimate sacrifice. It is the sign of a new covenant given to you through his shed blood. Christ asks us to do this in remembrance of him. But in honor of his sacrifice, please refrain from this table if you have some unconfessed sin that you know you're not ready to confess to him yet. As you remember that God is a God of relationship, head behind our torn curtains on stage, our symbolic Holy of Holies tonight, and know that you are welcome to enter in and take advantage of his presence. Be in his presence, just you and him, and lift up your heart to him in prayer. And lastly, as you remember that our God is a God of great love, pick up the envelope and the pen that you found as you walked in on your chair. Pull out the paper and write a letter to God acknowledging his great love and acknowledging your own thankfulness for his great sacrifice. When you're finished, go ahead and seal it. And write your own address on the front of the envelope. We are going to be sending love letters to God and you're going to mail it to him. But really, you're going to mail it to yourself so that in a few months, you can remember what a great, loving God that you serve. And I'm going to close us in prayer, but I just want you to know that there's no specific order that you need to go to these stations in. In fact, you don't even have to go to all of them. This is just a guided way for you to remember and to interact with God. There's no rules. There's no time limit. This is just your time to be with Him, however, um, however your heart leads. The only thing is that we ask that as you leave, just leave quietly in respect to those still communing with God. So let me pray for us.
There was a day we held our breath and felt the sting, the bitter death, when all our hopes were buried in the grave.